Hello everyone, thank you for joining us back again. This next section will be the cross-questioning section. The way this will work is both speakers will be at the podium. We will begin with Muhammad Hijab. He will ask a question. He'll have one minute to formulate the question. Edward, you'll have two minutes to answer. This will continue until Muhammad has been able to ask three questions. Then we will alternate. That means Edward will ask three questions. Again, each question will be one minute each. And each answer, this time by Muhammad, will be two minutes each. So if I can ask both Edward and Muhammad to join me at the podium, or go to the podium. Thank you. It would be like a duet into the... Just one mic? Okay. I think I'll go in here as well. Oh, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me when to start. I mean... Frank, Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin from 1950. Okay. <laughs> I'm the only one old enough to know that joke. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, do I have a minute? So let me just give yes. my stopwatch on so I know. Yeah. Okay, um, I was going to say that you touched upon morality, and I think it's an important thing uh, to talk about because I have heard lots of your um, debates before, and I'm um, intrigued to hear your answer to the particular, this particular question. On naturalism, what scientific explanation can you provide for the existence or the objectivity of morality? The answer is that I can give a better explanation for morality on atheism than on theism, even if it's not a perfect answer. Because on theism, someone looks into a book and without any proof that God really said it, saying, well, God said it, therefore it must be true regardless of what we think about it, just because God said it, which eclipses human reason. On atheism, what we do is we wrestle it out with our reasoning, and there are a whole avenue of areas by which we can assess morality, and even if they're not perfect, they're more reliable than believing in a deity. For instance, there's consequentialism, the consequences of actions being good or bad. There is the notion that our moral values stem from our biological nature. See, the problem with saying that morality comes from God is circular, because what you're doing is you are positing a God so you can have objective moral values that you can then use to try to show that that God exists. And that is not a valid form of argument. Thank you for that answer, Adi. Um, I've got a follow-up question, which is not on that morality thing, on something else, on naturalism. Uh, on atheistic naturalism, what scientific experiment would you conduct, for example, or could you refer us to? that tells us about the existence of mathematics. How can you prove mathematics through science? It's very easy. We prove mathematics empirically. For instance, two of one object and two of another object equals four. But what's important about that is that is so axiomatic that it couldn't be altered. For instance, God couldn't appear right now and say, by divine fiat, there are three debaters standing at the podium, not two. And so mathematics and logic are actually arguments against the supernatural because they show laws of logic and laws of mathematics that cannot be altered. You see, conceptually, it doesn't even work to say God could make two and two equals five. And so on naturalism, we discover the laws of nature. We don't invent them, and they're not prescribed by anybody. So for instance, we discovered the laws of geometry. Nobody invented them. We discovered the workings of calculus. We discovered the laws of engineering. Nobody invented it that if we put up a building this way, it'll collapse. If we put up a building the other way, it will collapse. We discovered it, just like we discover what medicines work. So therefore, on naturalism, we would expect that these laws could not be altered by anyone, a god, or any other type of being. Um, the issue with that is that you know, mathematics, the mind, and all those things are first-person inquiries, whereas 
science is a third person inquiry, so it would be very difficult to bridge the gap. But on this point of, once again, on naturalism, I have another question, because you made mention of some historical events. Now, obviously, we both believe in parts of history. For example, we believe in you know, the slave trade, we believe in the Holocaust, we believe in you know, things that have happened even all the way back to the prehistoric age. If witness testimony, which is what is required for history to take place, for example, uh, your mother's history uh, of what happened to her, or whatever it may be, how can you, how can you legitimize witness testimony on naturalism? And if it's not legitimized, does that mean that we can deny things like slavery, the Holocaust, and so on? Well, you see, the answer to that is by empirical evidence, we know that certain things can happen. If I said that I flew here on an airplane today, nobody would question it. If I said I just flapped my arms and flew here bodily, you would question it. If I told you that somebody crossed a river to get to the other side, you would accept it. If I told you that somebody was levitated from one side of the river to the other, you wouldn't. This shows that we have an inbuilt already recognition through logic and reason and experience of understanding eyewitness events that are within the realm of what we know to be probable and those which are not. If I said that somebody drove me here tonight for the debate in a car, you would believe me. If I said space aliens picked me up in an interstellar spacecraft and brought me here, you wouldn't believe me. So we shouldn't shy away from the common sense experience that already helps us distinguish the natural from the supernatural. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Mohammed, I'm handing you yes. a five different translations of Surah 434. Yes. Um, each one talks about men being in charge of women and there's nothing corresponding about women being in charge of men. And each of the seven translations from different respected translators of the Quran speak about husbands having the right to, under circumstances of defiance and arrogance, beat their wives. Do you agree or disagree with both men ruling over women in the surah and the permission to beat them as set forth in the surah? I certainly disagree with the translation because the word qawwamun in Arabic means maintainers and protectors. And this word qama yakumu literally means to stand up. And that's why you'll find that the majority of translators translate it like that. As for the verse that talks about uh, daraba, which is the Arabic word, almost there is a consensus among the scholars of Islam that this is not to be in vengeful or attacking or harmful or hurtful uh, action. This is talking about something which is Symbolic, and the evidence of that is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "La darar wa la tiran," that you cannot harm or reciprocate harm. So I think there is a problem here with the understanding of the verse, and also the Prophet said, "La tadribu ima Allah," don't hit the women slaves of Allah, meaning the women. And he said, "The worst of you are those who hit the women," and that's why I think if you look at the totality of evidence, um, then there is a bit more nuance than you think. Okay. Uh, Muhammad, you quoted the Quran a lot tonight. Let me ask you, why is the Quran a more credible final revelation of God, having been dictated to the prophet by the angel Gabriel, than the Book of Mormon as the final revelation of God, having been dictated in the 19th century in upstate New York by the angel Moroni to the prophet Joseph Smith? The reason why is because the Quran has certain parameters and certain challenges that the Book of Mormon doesn't have. For example, it has the inimitability challenge, it has the preservation challenge. The Quran is the only preserved book. It has predictions that predict the future that couldn't have been known at the time. On probability, we find it very difficult. I'll explain that in the conclusion when I'll give you, when I'll give you more expansion of what I'm saying. The Quran has a language that completely descopes or descoped the Arabic language of the people of the time, and it was recognized by those linguists as something which was extraordinary. The Quran has a structural feature that even Orientalist scholars like Raymond Farron have looked at and said that this is something which cannot be possible considering the circumstantial revelation of the Quran. So there's many reasons. And I think the main point is the Quran gives us a falsification challenge. And since you're a fan of science, the fact that it gives us a falsification challenge makes it 
in many ways, quite scientific. Uh, Mohammed, you have many times embraced what we would call the Kalam cosmological argument, the first cause argument. If, in fact, time and space began with the Big Bang, and if something cannot come from nothing, but God created, Allah created the world ex nihilo, out of nothing, how did an immaterial being with no physical attributes, no physical brain or body, create everything around us in a context where there was no time and space for A to cause B, how did he do it? How did, what was the mechanism by which this immaterial being without time and space created time and space and matter? Well, as the Arabs say, Adam and Dalil al Adam. So it's an argument from ignorance. If we don't know how something works, it doesn't mean it is, it's false. However, having said that, there is no agreement among Muslims that the universe was created ex nihilo. So there were some people, like Al Ghazali and others, who did believe this. But other people, like Ibn Taymiyyah, believe that. God perpetually created different things pre-eternally. So once again, there is a scope of interpretation in the Islamic text. Either way, the point is, causation doesn't even factor in here because cause, a cause is something which brings rise to phenomena, whereas dependency is something which is relying on something else. So time or no time, whether you believe in the A theory of time or the B theory of time, you still have to reckon, you have to deal with the fact that you have things which rely upon each other and if we compile all the things which rely upon each other together, you would have no existence. So you have to have an independence. So the contingency argument does not rely upon causality, which is why, to be frank with you, I didn't make it as a main argument for myself. Okay, thank you. That's it. Thank you so much. That concludes the cross rapid fire question uh, portion of the debate. The last portion of the debate will be the audience Q&A. Uh, I'll quickly give an overview of how this is supposed to work. I have three questions here for Mohammed, three questions here for Edward, one for both of you. I will ask the question, whoever it is directed towards will have two minutes to respond, and then two minutes will be given to the other person to also respond, presenting their own perspective. So with that, I will begin with the first question. Uh, okay. Before I do that, I have a request if people can actually not use the Wi-Fi. I think we have too many people and it's crashing the live stream. <laughs> so if you guys have data, Verizon is great. Um, right, okay. <clears throat> All right, so we'll begin. The first question is directed towards Mohammed. Uh, why would God not show himself when he knows the controversy that goes through everyone's mind? Well, it's a good question. Thank you very much. The question has an empiricist presupposition, which is that, in fact, knowledge should be known through the five senses. Well, as we've discovered today, that's not actually the case. So things like the logic or the, the logic through which science is done is actually based on metaphysical logical principles. Time is not seen. Uh, mathematics is not based on science. There are lots of things which are f felt, uh, which, are, which are found out without the empirical method. So the this empirical naturalistic presupposition is rejected, and if we look at the development of philosophy in the 20th century, we'll find that even people like A.J. Ayer, who wrote a book on positivism, he admits to some of these uh, things, and he capitulates intellectually uh, to these points. So, frankly, what I'll say to you is that it, the, 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 answer, the question is flawed, it's based on an empiricist presupposition, which would mean, by extension, that science itself couldn't exist because it's based on presuppositions which are unscientific, otherwise unempirical. Thank you. The issue is there are things like logic and mathematics where the very working out of the theorem show you the truthfulness or falsity. However, the question of whether God exists or not is a factual question and thus makes it subject to an empirical investigation. Whether there is such an all-powerful being in the universe is a factual question akin to whether space aliens have visited us, whether in fact we do live after death or not. When it comes to questions of fact, the empirical method does apply. But there's another problem here in that both the Bible and the Quran unmistakably promise eternal punishment for non-belief. As a matter of fundamental fairness, we can say that it is unfair of God 
to punish us for not believing in him if he withholds evidence that would enable us to believe in him, and that's the argument from divine hiddenness. So the laws of logic and mathematics don't have causative properties. So you can't say the number seven as an abstraction causes something to happen, but you can say, and they do say, as Muhammad does, God does cause things to happen, and if an agent has causative powers and can make or break something, that's subject to empirical investigation. Thank you both. Uh, second question, this is directed towards you, Edward. Why are atheists focused on a God that would serve us? Any God would not function to offer us what we want. What? So the question is basically, if a, if a God exists, why are, why are atheists so focused on the fact that a God like that would serve us because God himself is transcendent and he would not necessarily function to offer us what we want? Okay, the question though has a problem and that's that if you accept an abstract deity that has not claimed to have been revealed to humanity, then it's understandable that God would not tailor the evidence to meet our needs. But if a God has supposedly given us a number of revelations, Bible, Quran, Book of Mormon, whatever else, then we have a right to use our reason to expect that such a God is intending to reveal itself to us and the failure of that God to fill in the gaps of the revelation or the failure of that God to provide us with a reliable revelation makes non-belief reasonable. If non-belief is reasonable, it's inculpable and we are not blameworthy for non-belief because we weren't given sufficient evidence. If we are not blameworthy for non-belief, then it's unfair to punish us for not believing what we didn't have sufficient evidence to believe. And if we are punished for not believing what we didn't have sufficient evidence to believe, then that calls God's moral perfection into question because we are being punished unjustly. Can I add to it? Or? Yeah, yes, yes, we have one minute. No, two. Oh, okay. Um, to your one. I agree with him, actually. Um, and this is a point of agreement, actually, between me and Edward. And I think the reason why he's using this argument is potentially because he had conversations with Christians before where the theology is a little bit different. But the, the premise is true. What Edward is saying is absolutely correct. In fact, if God doesn't reveal himself to you and then punishes you as a result, this is unjust. And that's why the Quran says, وَمَا كُنَّ مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا Chapter 17. Verse 15, that we were not going to punish them until we sent them a messenger. So scholars of Islam said, even if you die an atheist, or a Hindu, or a Christian, and even though you're born with this fitrah, with this predisposition, which wasn't tackled, hopefully you'll talk about it, this predisposition to believe in God, which we have evidence for now, even though all of that is in place, God will still not punish those individuals until they're given sufficient exposure and that is exactly correct. I think you're right. Thank you. Uh, the next question is directed towards Muhammad. So it's basically the case of bad design in science. There is a concept of vestigial futures, futures that are a hindrance or otherwise less than perfect in many organisms. If the universe runs without inconsistency, what would explain vestigial futures? And the particular example is that was given is the woman's pelvis, which is far too small and creates a very difficult and painful birthing process. Well, I think this is called the argument of ignorance. Just because you don't know the function of something, it doesn't mean it's functionless. So for example, we don't know what the appendix does. It doesn't mean it has no function. It just means we haven't discovered that yet. We don't know why two electrons can be in one place at the same time on quantum mechanics. It doesn't mean that's a false notion, even though it goes against the rules of logic and it goes against some of the things, conventions that we believe in. So just because you don't know something, it doesn't make it false. So that's the first point. As for the second point of bad design, I mean, who's the judge of bad design? I mean, at least with the fine-tuning argument, you have some kind of probability, mathematical probability that can be attached to this kind of uh, equation. You're saying that the chances of there not being you know, a universe or the universe having a non-life-permitting range is x, which is a mathematical kind of uh, uh, rendering. So, here, we have to be kind of honest here and say that this is an aesthetic value judgment at best. And aesthetic value judgments are not 
our opinions, frankly. They're your opinion. If you see something that's bad design, that's your opinion. You might think it's bad design, but there might be a reason. Now, there's one more thing I want to add because I've got a minute left. I think people have misunderstood my, under my argument from uniformity. I'll add it to the conclusion. Like my good friend Faraz Zahabi mentioned one time in a podcast that I've done with him. For example, let's take a coin. If we flip a coin, it can either be heads or tails. Today, we can flip it, it's either going to be heads or tails. Tomorrow is going to be either heads or tails. We don't expect the coin to be flipped and turn into a butterfly. Why? Because we accept that there's a kind of coherence that exists, there are kind of constants that exist. So in order to do science, you need to know, or you need to presuppose, that this uniformity exists. Otherwise, your calculations today will be meaningless tomorrow. And that's why Albert Einstein said, that a priori, we expect a chaotic universe. Meaning, from the mind, you expect there not to be this kind of order. So this underpins, or it's even more undercutting, if you like, than the fine-tuning argument, which is why I presented it. So that's, that's it. Thank you. The problem is that when you posit a god who is supposed to be all-powerful and morally perfect, then defects in our design are not justified based on those attributes of God. For instance, I pointed out how the gene that can help fight malaria can also cause sickle cell anemia. We know that we humans have back problems because we stood up too soon. Uh, we know that there are defects in our bodies. We could be more resistant to cancer. We could be more resistant to viruses. Uh, we could have a better digestive system. So. God cannot get off the hook here because he is presented as an all-powerful being who is morally perfect. An all-powerful being who is morally perfect doesn't make these missteps in design. And we already know our vulnerability to disease. Uh, for instance, we already know that we just have a very few decades to be in good condition, and then as we get older, we begin to decline. And so that's not something that we would expect from a morally perfect God. Uh, we wouldn't expect unnecessary pain. If God wants us to take our hand off the fire so we don't get burned, we would expect pain. But if we're trapped in a burning forest and we burn to death painfully, pain has no value. And we wouldn't expect that unnecessary suffering with no purpose on theism. It's more likely on atheism. So given the claims of God's moral perfection and omnipotence, uh, defects in design are not defensible. Thank you. Next question. This is to you, Edward. Uh, you said there is no evidence to prove the existence of God. What proof do you personally need to believe, and how would you recognize that? You see, this is the difference between me and a religious person. I'm subject to evidence. Religions don't change regardless of the evidence, but an empirically minded atheist like me would. If right now Muhammad and I were uh, levitated to the ceiling, if my father who was dead for 18 years walked in this room right now in his inimitable Yiddish accent, and I recognized him asking me why I'm not in my office working, and then floated <laughs> in the air, and, 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 and said, uh, both of you, Mormonism is the true religion. If Muhammad and I right now were teleported to Mecca and I saw the most amazing astronomical displays telling me to become a Muslim right away, I would. Now you might say, well, this is the result of an advanced space alien, but being an evidentialist, I would believe it's a supernatural being until someone showed me that it was advanced space aliens. So the difference between atheists like me and those who subscribe to religion is we are open to changing if we have direct evidence, whereas there very few religious people who would say, if this happened, I would not believe in God, whereas atheists like me can clearly say, if the following things happen, I will believe in God, but we all know they won't happen. But if they did, I would. Can I add to it? Yes, yes we've got two minutes. We both. Yeah. Um, the first point on not being religious, it, dep it depends on how you define religion. Because frankly, if you take a, like an Emil Durkheim approach, who's a sociologist, he defined religion in more broad terms than would be found in vernacular, vernacularly in dictionaries, for example, which has to be through God or whatever. 
Frankly, you could make the argument that atheist people are very religious, in so much as they have axioms and they have leaps of faith which they believe in. For instance, if we take, for example, science, science and especially something like quantum physics, you don't do the experiments yourself. You rely upon witness testimony. You don't go into laboratory and ex repeat experiments X amount of times in order to believe it. So in, in order for you to have an understanding of science, you have to have a leap of faith in trusting those individuals who teach you about science, your teachers, your school books, and so on. I mean, you believe in equality. And once again, these are precepts which, frankly, are axiomatic, meaning they don't have any evidence to substantiate them. Even John Locke, who is the founder of liberalism, he, he based it on God, by the way. And that's why in your, in the, uh, you know, the Declaration of Independence, created beings is being referred to over and over again. So really, you don't have a right, a epistemic right, to, call, to talk about equality without having some kind of leap of faith, frankly, in those things. So atheists have faith all the time. They have faith in things they don't see. They have faith in things they don't interact with. And what I'm going to say is that this is where, as John Gray said, some people can wrap a, you know, a discussion of ideology in sociological format and make it seem as if it's a religious. But in fact, it is actually, in terms of its conventions and epistemic weight, the same as any kind of religious belief. Uh, as for levitating and so on, well, you believe in uh, levitating, but it just has to happen in the quantum physics realm where things do levitate and things do flow. Harry Potter exists in the quantum physics world, but an atheist would never believe it unless a scientist told them. That's belief, that's faith. Thank you. Uh, next question to Mohammed. Would God provide us with autonomy, and does that negate the good and evil argument? Can you, can you repeat? Yeah. Would God provide us with autonomy, our free will, and does that negate the good and evil argument? Yes, so on Islamic uh, traditionalism, God has endowed us with what you call khayar, or the idea of choice and free will. And in fact, evil is a necessary part of that, because if you don't have evil, you cannot make a decision. There will just be good and good to decide from. You can't decide from good and good. There has to be good and bad. And therefore, you must be tested. A test makes no sense with the, existence, with the non-existence of evil. A test makes no sense with the non-existence of evil. So, sometimes the bad thing can be good for you. The Quran says, you could hate something, but it's actually very good for you. And the thing is, on theism, on Islamic theism, we believe in another domain. It's a metaphysical domain, which is Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Day of Judgment whereby all of those things that we are wronged in the dunya, the worldly life, you'll be recompensed for that. So we don't believe that when a child dies, that's just a random rearrangement of atoms, as would be the case, by the way, on naturalism. It's a random rearrangement of atoms. If I slap a snowman and I knock his head off, it's the same as if I cut a kid's head off. Because it's just on naturalism, frankly, it's just you know, a rearrangement of atoms. And in order for you to make any sense of that, you'd have to impose a subjective value judgment on it, which you'd have to have faith in order to have in the first place. So frankly, I mean, what we believe is that the injustices of this world, Hitler, for example, was a very unjust man, killed six million individuals. He will be punished, hopefully, perpetually, in a domain where in which the punishment is not limited. Justice cannot be done on naturalism. It can only be done on a kind of system, a metaphysical system, which undoes all of the wrongs that happened in this world. Um, we may not like the implications of a godless world, but that doesn't mean that a god will come into existence just to rescue us from those implications. We may not like the fact that we end at death, but that doesn't mean a god will come about just so that we don't end at death if that God doesn't otherwise exist. Uh, the concept of free will is given more credit than it deserves. If you have two children, you don't let one of your children push the other off a cliff just so as not to interfere in free will. And so the question of free will or even the benefits of it do not justify the extreme pain and the extreme suffering that we undergo. So for instance, if we need to feel pain when we put our hand on a hot stove, that's understandable. But that pain does not serve a useful purpose 
if we are being innocently burnt by evil people and we have to suffer that agonizing death. So the fact that there is gratuitous, unnecessary, unexplained, horrendous suffering goes way beyond necessary slight evils and suffering which would have a beneficial and corrective purpose. So we can't say that any amount of suffering or any amount of horrible experience is justified because we need that in which to distinguish the good. Even a small amount of evil or a bearable amount of evil is enough to distinguish the good. It is the presence of unexplained, gratuitous, horrendous suffering that is incompatible with an all good and all powerful God. Thank you. Uh, last question directed towards Edward to summarize. Um, essentially, Islam provides objective morality. Do you believe there is such a thing as objective morality? And if so, how would you explain why atheists 30 years ago would object to, say, homosexuality? Well, I believe that there are objective moral values and they're not prescribed by anybody. There is no law giver. Now, I was just asked 30 years ago how atheists would have responded to homosexuality. This actually proves my point. 30 years ago, many atheists may not have recognized the importance of allowing such personal freedom. What that means is not that anybody who condemned uh, persons who love those of the same gender were right or wrong then, it meant that we hadn't yet discovered the truth that these are people that deserve equal rights. So for instance, in the 1950s when I was growing up, people would be arrested for being gay. They would be put in prison for being gay. The fact that we don't do that now, and it's been illegal to do so in any state since 2003, shows that the more we evolve, the more we discover these moral truths. Not that somebody invents them and imposes us on them, that by our natural development, we discover these truths. For instance, it used to be that religious people would burn women accused of being witches. But we don't do that anymore because we discovered the moral truth that it's wrong to do that to these women. Uh, irrespective of the Bible saying thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So the more we get away from religious fundamentalist edicts, the more moral and tolerant we become, which shows that morality cannot be dependent on religious fundamentalist or orthodox edicts because it is our pulling away from them that makes us more moral, more compassionate, and more tolerant. You get two minutes. I get two minutes, okay. But I don't know what religious edicts the American founding fathers had used in order to, for at least some period of time, allow slavery, racist slavery, uh, what Stalin used in order to do what he did, what Hitler used, frankly, to do what he did. This is not the work of religion. This is the work of people who use ideological justification in order to commit certain acts. The same way as which some people, it's conceivable to think that some religious people will use religious justification in order to commit certain acts. So I don't think there should be an epistemic preferencing of one, uh, one thing over another here. I think we should just realize that uh, epistemology drives us to certain forces, certain things, and you can't really say, well, religion is better than non-religion. Once again, that would de depend on how you define religion in the first place. But having said all of that, I mean, we've talked a lot about gay rights today and all those things, but on the harm principle, which is what John Stuart Mill proposed, part of social, uh, social liberalism, that you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else, well, frankly, that would entail that uh, sex between a brother and sister or a brother and a brother, so long as there's contraception used and there's no deformed babies, that should be allowed as well. And I haven't seen anyone doing incest right activism uh, in America for a very long time. And frankly, on liberalism, that's what you should do. You know, just because they're a minority group of people that are still in the closet, in the incest closet, it doesn't mean now that they should be treated any less on liberalism. So I think we have to be 
we have to be um, completely honest with ourselves in our social analysis. And if what we're doing is selecting certain social things which have become popular in the 21st century to make a case about God's existence, then I think really we're being academically disingenuous. So I think at the end of the day, whatever principle you're going to have, you have to apply it uh, across the board. And if it is the harm principle on social liberalism, then incest should be allowed in this country and people should be able to do that. Thank you. Final question. Uh, this is directed to both of you. Uh, Edward, because you began, I'll start with Mohammed. Please address the viability of Pascal's wager. Well, I mean, Pascal is kind of like, it's not really an argument, to be honest with you, which is why I didn't kind of make it. Pascal was a famous mathematician who talked about, you know, basically making a wager, you know, betting on the fact that God, God exists because the um, because doing otherwise may mean that you know, you'll, you'll, you'll die and go to hell and so on, and so therefore it makes sense to do that. What we're saying is that, fair enough, there is some truth in that. I mean, if you think about it, the Quran actually affirms some of that, where it says, you know, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ كَفَرْتُمْ بِهِ What if it was from God? What if this was from God? And you are disbelieving in it. So it's a thought experiment. Right? It's more of a thought experiment rather than an argument. So I think the maximum we can do with it is use that as a thought experiment, make people think about death, you know, make people think about the fact that they're going to die, and what kind of ideology or what kind of belief system they want to have with them when they are in their graves, frankly, because atheism will not do anything as a matter of fact. Now, I'm not saying therefore God exists, because that's not an argument. I've made that clear. It's not an argument to say, well, the implications of atheism is that you know, you're going to be in the sick bed. You're going to be maybe 75 years old. One in two people in the United States of America are going to have cancer, just like in the UK, according to cancer research. And what is better for you? I mean, as to be optimistic that there's going to be continuation of that life or to know that actually you're going to just become bones and dust. Obviously, from an implications perspective, theism, and especially theism with afterlife implications, has better impl optimistic implications for you. Your, your memories will be wiped away, your experiences will be wiped away, and your bodies will be wiped away. That's atheist naturalism. But the implications of, um, of theism is that actually there will be continuation. This is just the beginning. And so this is not an argument, but it is an implication. Well, there is a problem with Pascal's wager. Now, Muhammad just admitted that the Quran does talk about punishment and hell for not believing in Islam as the Bible talks about punishment and hell for not believing in Christianity. What Pascual's wager did was it made the error of automatically assuming that if there is a God, this being will judge us by how we worship this being rather than how good we are to each other. And so the wager actually is false because it presupposes without proof that God is such an evil being, if there is a God, that regardless of how good we are, unless we adopt the right religion, we will burn in hell forever. Now, I'm sure that Pascal, who was a Christian, would not have accepted that someone is meeting the wager if they were a Muslim. And I think that the defect is whenever we say without any evidence whatsoever other than ancient hearsay in ancient books which we know were written by fallible men as women weren't even involved in the writing of these books when we say we are certain that the ultimate force in the universe will punish you unless you adopt my religion. That is nothing but primitive exclusivism. Well, we, I think we got one more. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you both. Uh, that concludes our audience Q&A. We will now proceed to the closing statements. Each person will have 15 minutes to give theirs, and we will begin with Mohammed. I have a right to go get your notes. Uh, okay, why not, why not? Yeah. Get my, I have a right to get my notes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Like a lawyer, no. Like yeah, no, I don't want to take up your advantage. <laughs> Thank you.
15, yeah. All right, uh, please calm down. 15 minutes left. Nearly finished. I'll start when it's quiet. I'll start when it's quiet. Just to quickly, I'm starting now, just to quickly uh, kind of comment on the last thing that he talked about, ancient hearsay and so on. Democracy is an ancient concept. Liberalism is an ancient concept. It's still, it's still adopted by um, you know, mainstream society. That's the genetic fallacy, basically, to criticize something based on where it came from. At any rate, I found it quite interesting in the last um, speech that um, Eddie, Edward had, he actually made an interesting capitulation. He admitted that 99% of things natural science can explain. That means 1% of things are supernatural. That means miracles are possible. So that is very happy. I'm happy to hear that. All right. Secondly now, what he's talked about, about cause and effect. Now, the definition of a cause is something which brings rise to phenomena. I can cause a house to be. For example, I can build a house. Yes, I can build a house. But I can die and the house will continue to be, yes? So I don't need to exist in order for the house to continue existing. Dependence, on the other hand, is when you rely on something else. So he made the mistake of saying that contingency, which is dependence, relies upon cause and effect. It doesn't. Which is why I didn't really mention cause and effect to avoid this discussion altogether. Let us agree for the sake of arguments, okay? Let's agree that there's no such thing as cause and effect. The contingency argument, the way I framed it, is still valid because I didn't mention cause and effect at all. Let me tell you why. Bertrand Russell, interesting atheist, when he was commenting on the cosmological argument, the cosmological argument, Ghazali's argument that William Lane Craig and those other guys are making popular now in this country, it's Ghazali's argument, everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. Okay. So Bertrand Russell said, but this is the problem of composition. Because you're saying that just because there are causes in the universe, it doesn't mean that that cause will be applied to the universe. So he says, for example, just because we have mothers as part of the human race, it doesn't mean that the human race itself has mother. Imagine a wall, like Trump likes walls. Yeah, you have a wall. Just because this is Bertrand Russell, it's a very valid argument. He says, just because a wall is made up of small parts, it doesn't mean that the wall itself is small. He's right. Bertrand Russell was right. However, what if the wall is made up of red parts? The wall itself can be red. So the fallacy of composition is a double-edged sword. Because in order for it to be a proper fallacy, it needs to have perfect knowledge of the whole. If you don't have perfect knowledge of the whole, you can't claim it to be a fallacy. So both the theist and the atheist are in a gridlock. Because the atheist is saying, well, it can't be the small part, it can't be the big. But the theist is saying, well, the red part can make, red bricks can make a red wall. And both can be possible. But both, both can be argued against. You see? So this is why I use the contingency argument. Let me bring back the argument that I used. Causation. For the sake of argument, no problem. You can have causation. Let's pretend, you know, there's no causation. Let's pretend. No problem. Let's pretend. But it's possible that it can exist and it's possible that it can't outside the universe on a logical basis. However, contingency, dependence, I made an ontological argument. A mathematical argument. You have a set. Things within the set are all dependent. Yes? Now you can't have the existence of things if everything is dependent on everything else. If existence depends upon dependent things, existence would never exist. You have two options. Either there's an independent outside, 
Or this thing itself is the independent. This series is the independent. And what is it? The independent, the necessary independent. However, is it conceivable to think of this series if we take out D2 as different? Yes. And we said a possible existence is something which can be rearranged. Wait a minute now, this is a serious argument. I'm not going to be William Lane Craig here today. I know you're used to this. I use his, his um, debate with William Lane Craig. This is his argument. I know the weaknesses of the argument. I didn't use this argument. I want the most undercutting argument. No one can crack this argument. I've read from Plato to Leibniz all the way through to Russell. And believe me, this is the argument no one can solve. This is the uncrackable code. So he tried to crack the code by saying, well, the necessary existence should be, should have the entailment of the dependent things. Well, I'm saying the complete opposite. I'm saying that it's impossible for it to be made up of parts and still be the necessary existence. Because a possible existence is a, an existence that is subject to change. So, to use this phraseology, if we look at the weight of the evidence, the totality of the evidence, where extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, we have an extraordinary evidence. We have an absolutely extraordinary evidence, which works in the mind mathematically, and works in physical reality cosmologically, and works on first principles. And we get the independent, self-sufficient one entity, which we as Muslims call Allah. That's it. What if there's a multiverse? What if there's a multiverse? No problem. Have a multiple, an infinite amount of universes. Or not even just universes, because why discriminate f towards universes? Creations. You still you need something to depend upon those things. And we said it can't be that because you can envisage taking a, a, a universe in and out. And so it's dependent upon the structure. It's over. You see here, it's important to be honest with ourselves. He's a lawyer. A lot of lawyers are referred to as liars, but he's not one of them. He's a good man. And as a lawyer, when he goes into the, the, the courtroom, he refers to witness testimony. He makes abductive arguments, like CSI, uh, CSI forensics put the evidences together. It's not God of the gaps. Just in the same way as if you put food for a dog, and then you go away, and the, and the food is eaten, you're not going to say that's a dog of the gaps argument. It's just an abductive inference, which he does every time. And if it's not that, if, if you don't do an abductive inference, then all of the cases he's represented have been miscarriages of justice, which I'm sure he wouldn't do. And the point here is this. The point is, when we put the totality of evidence, asking for more evidence, you know what it's like? When we've given you ontological, metaphysical, a priori, a posteriori, scientific, physical, mathematic, probabilistic evidences, it's like asking for a torch. When you're in the middle of daylight, give me a torch. But <laughs> why do you need a torch, my friend? Everything around you, you're locked into the arguments. Everywhere you go, there's arguments. There's evidence, there's science, even to the extent whereby, even to the extent whereby you're born with that feeling of believing in God. And then you have to socially construct, according to Justin Barrett, and others, your atheism. Just like you use other social constructed ideas, like second wave feminism, liberalism. I don't think people that wrote about liberalism were women, by the way. You were talking about what about these men, they're all men. Liberalism is written by men, John Locke, John Stuart Mill, Rousseau, Montesquieu, <laughs> uh, Thomas Hobbes. I don't, hear, I don't see any women's names there. So frankly, let's not play these games. What I will say is this. What I will say is, as Muslims, we have additional evidence. And this is the evidence from Revelation. The Quran says, That the Romans had been defeated in low land, nearby land. 
And after that defeat, they will become victorious. It makes predictions which materialize. And look at this, just as one piece of evidence. And you can look at my videos for more, but this is just one thing. When someone makes a succession of predictions of the future, what is the probability that some of those predictions will be false? If you add all of those things and you aggregate them in your total probability chart, and you ask the question, if someone makes all of these if someone makes all of these predictions of the future, like the Qur'an does, what's the probability that this could have been a guess? Well, there's a way of finding that out through mathematical probability theory, for example, or epistemic probability. So, frankly, we do have an argument. It's not... And by the way, there's something else here, very important. He made a good point. He made a very good point. He said that why is it the case that miracles are confined or time-bound? He's right. For a Christian, that would be a great argument. If you say to a Christian, how comes Jesus rose the dead when we couldn't see it? Absolutely right about that. Where the Quran says, We have not sent you to, except for to Muhammad, all of humankind. The reason why those prophetic miracles were localized, like Jesus, or Moses splitting the sea, or whatever it may be, is because it appealed, or is meant to appeal, to that time and that people. As for the Qur'an, itself it claims to be the miracle. It's an auditory miracle, so that you can analyze it in any time and any place. So it's not giving an unfair advantage to the primary audience. You can try and falsify the Qur'an now. It gives you a way to try and do so. You can try and imitate the Qur'an now, it challenges you, to, challenges you to do so. And you can try and look at those things in the Qur'an which claim to be happening in the future and analyze whether they did in hindsight now because we have seen whether that happened or not. For example, these are some examples. Now, in the last two or three minutes, I want to say something important. Putting this discussion to the side, you know, Edward is one of our friends here in America. And the reason why I'm putting this in the end is because I've kind of finished everything and I wanted to say this. He works actively to promote the rights of Muslims in this country. And it's people like Edward that allow for Muslims in this country and in the West to be able to be guaranteed the same kind of freedoms, frankly, that other, every other person should have. And I believe that if you're going to believe in something, be consistent with it. And though maybe not in the field of atheism and God's existence, he might not be fully consistent, but in his morality, he's a man of consistency. He opposes Trump's ban on Muslims. He's a friend of the Muslims. And what I want to end off by saying here is, this is the kind of person who we're happy to have as a friend of the Muslim community here in the USA. We need... Honestly, after things like the Christchurch massacre or other terrorist attacks happening on both sides, bad things are happening, we need to be able to build bridges. I believe Edward is the man or the kind of person Edward is, is the kind of person we need to be friends with, we need to invite to our houses, we need to be kind to, we need to show courtesy to, and we need to respect highly, despite religious or ideological disagreements. We will agree to disagree, but we will also agree to agree where our interests are mutual and where we can oppose a common threat to both of our existences. Edward is consistent because he does not like arbitrariness, which is a, which is a theme in liberalism, where one community are not treated the same as another community. If there's a law, and you believe in liberalism, let that law be applied to everyone. And he's done some great work. He has done some great work opposing arbitrary kinds of judgments that have happened in different states. And he was telling me about that. And really and truly, we take our hat off to him and, his, and people like him. Finally, 
Finally, I want to say in my last half a minute left that if I said anything to offend anyone here, that I apologize. That that was not my intention. And that obviously this is a subject which we really feel passionate about. And as a superior to me in knowledge and experience, I want to thank from the bottom of my heart Edward's contribution to today's discussion. It's been edifying, it's been brilliant for me, and I'm sure it's been fantastic for you. You're welcome at any time. I'm sure I can say that on behalf of the university. And hopefully we can meet another day. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mohammed. The issue that Mohammed raises, again, pinning his argument on the concept of a necessary being, remember the problem with that is the problem is that a necessary fact cannot explain a contingent fact without introducing a new contingent fact in need of explanation. And to see why, notice that a necessary fact cannot explain a contingent fact by entailing it because then any fact entailed by a necessary fact must itself be necessary, and this sets up the regression uh, all the way back into the past, which Mohammed is trying to avoid. Now, with respect to my comment that 99% of all scientific discoveries will show to be natural, that doesn't mean the 1% will be supernatural. It means the opposite. It means the likelihood of anything being supernatural is very implausible. And the way I said it was that unless something appears miraculous, like the stars rearranging themselves telling us what to do, it is a god of the gaps argument. Uh, as far as the Quran's prediction is concerned, both the Quran and the Bible have failed to make the kinds of pure predictions which would show the supernatural. Now, with respect to the Quran, it was finished in 632, but it was not codified into a final written form until uh, 20, 18 years later in 650 by the Caliph Uthman. And now, the only earliest version we have of a 90% complete Quranic text is from the uh, mid 8th century, which could be a, almost 80 years after the Quran was initially uh, given to Muhammad. Now, another problem is with respect to translations. Every time I point out something to Muhammad about the translations that I have before me, even eight or nine of them, his response is he disagrees with the translation. I don't necessarily disagree that Muhammad might understand the Quran in the original Arabic far better than all these translations. My argument is from divine hiddenness, if the Quran is God's ultimate revelation to humanity, it is inconsistent with that purpose for us who speak only English not to have a reliable translation. Uh, Muhammad was not able to demonstrate how an immaterial incorporeal being created time and space. See, what Muhammad was trying to do as a valiant attempt was to rescue was to rescue some vestige of the supernatural from a purely natural universe, and ultimately it was unsuccessful. He was not able to refute at all my argument from evolution. He did not refute my argument from evil. He was not able to explain how an all-powerful God that can prevent a lot of evil still has to allow so much evil. He did not adequately refute my argument from divine hiddenness because he was not able to give a reason why a God who wants us to know his will would withhold the very evidence that we need 
to be able to believe in that God. I, as an atheist, gave you clear examples of the type of miraculous occurrences which would make me turn into a believer. In fact, if my dead father appeared right now, transported Muhammad and me to Mecca and told me, and I knew it was my dad, that since dying he realized that Islam was the perfect religion, I would convert right away. So I'm subject to and open to the evidence. The other thing that Muhammad did not refute was my claim that the Quran, like the Bible, the Quran, like the Bible, demands eternal punishment for choosing the wrong religion. I believe that we human beings have a right to use our reason and sense of justice to say that it is wrong for any all-powerful deity to condemn innocent people to eternal suffering because of an honest mistake in choosing the wrong religion. And so I believe to that extent, the Bible and the Quran are equally, uh, equally false. However, I have to say, the Quran did improve on the Bible in one area. If you read Jeremiah 19.9, you see that God threatens to make people eat their sons and daughters. Uh, in the Quran, there's no such vestige of cannibalism, so if God does exist, I thank him for in between the Bible and the Quran taking human flesh off the menu. <laughs> okay. Okay. The, uh, Muhammad was unable to refute the argument against a transcendental person. Because if you are a person, you have to have some boundary, some limit. To say that you are not in time and space and you are in time and space, what are we talking about? It's like some guy standing up waist deep in a hot tub. He's half in and half out. How can you be partially in time? How can God enter time? In order to enter time, you have to have a beginning in time. A timeless being cannot do anything. Either can an immaterial being. Now, I know that the concept that death is the end is very difficult for most people to tolerate. But on atheism, what's true is not what we would like to be true. What's true is what cold hard reality shows is true. There is no example whatsoever of conscious self-awareness being able to exist without a fully functional physical brain. If it were so, then Alzheimer's disease would not be able to eclipse consciousness. Again, Alzheimer's disease eclipses your consciousness, but when you die, you're fully intact in an immaterial form. It can't happen that way. Also, the argument from evolution with the common ancestry that we have with apes. We didn't evolve from apes, but we spun off and had a common ancestor. If you look at the fossil record of the precursors to Homo sapiens, who we are now, you see we evolved from a more primitive life form. Both the Bible and the Quran accept the notion of Adam and Eve. You can't have an Adam and Eve if evolution is true, which it is, because there was no such thing as the first perfect human couple. We evolved like any other creature. So if there was no Adam and Eve, both the Bible and the Quran are wrong in saying that there was, and of course if there was no Adam and Eve, then Christianity is completely wrong in talking about the sin in the Garden of Eden. Now uh, another thing that Muhammad was unable to do was to demonstrate, and I've seen other Muslim apologists try to do this, was to demonstrate that the language or the mode of Arabic itself used in the Quran had to have a divine authorship. You can have advanced language or poetic or useful verse, or you can make innovations in language, but that does not show that there was a supernatural origin. Also, he failed to show us what specific predictions in the Quran took, were made that turned out to be true. On one of his uh, YouTube videos, he talks about a Roman war which the Quran uh, 
predicted the Romans would lose, well, I looked it up, that war ended in 628 CE and the Quran was finished in 632 CE, so the Quran did not predict anything in the future. Uh, the other aspect of all of this is the incompatible properties of the concept of God, the very concept of God. God cannot be both omnipotent and omniscient. If God is omnipotent, it means God can do anything, including change his mind. But if God is omniscient, he always knew what he was going to do in the very end, so he cannot change his mind. So therefore, the properties of omniscience and omnipotence are incompatible. Uh, with respect to the fine-tuning argument that sort of Muhammad flirted with and then moved away from, if we look at that, on theism, you would not need any kind of fine-tuning because God would be capable of making us live in any environment. So the whole notion of fine-tuning is uh, nonsensical. But yet, if you look at atheism and there is no all-powerful God who could make us live in any environment, then we, uh, wouldn't, then we would need fine-tuning because there is no supernatural being to sustain us any which way, which makes fine-tuning curiously more likely on atheism. Now, I've heard Muslim apologists say that the Quran predicted that the universe is expanding. I looked at four different translations, and the only one that used the uh, term expanding was Mustafa Khattab in 2016. The three other translations, including the classic Pickthall and Abdullah Yusuf Ali, all of them had the vastness of space already existing. So if the Quran did predict that the universe is expanding, which meant that the Quran had divine foreknowledge before science that the Big Bang occurred, then only one out of four translations shouldn't be able to show that. So once again, on divine hiddenness, if the Quran is what God wants me to believe, then the Quran should have been translated into English. True. Also on the argument from evil, and I've touched upon this, is the distribution of pleasure and pain. On theism, we would expect that horrendous pain would only exist if there's a purpose that would aid our survival or our reproduction. So if I put my hand on the hot stove, it hurts, so I take my hand away. But let's say, again, I or some innocent animal are caught in a forest fire and we're unable to pull away from the pain, and we suffer a horrible death. Well, the pain of that burning to death did not contribute to my survival or reproduction, and so on atheism, it's understandable. On theism, it's, it's not understandable. Um, I referred earlier to the Bayesian probability analysis. On Bayesian probability analysis, which is widely used, you have to have prior knowledge of something. There's no prior knowledge of the supernatural, so if you use Bayesian confirmation uh, predictive ability, you would not be able to predict the supernatural. If the supernatural existed, there would be evidence of it. If consciousness could exist without a functional physical brain, there'd be evidence of it. If the Bible or the Quran predicted something which could only have been known by miraculous means when it was written, there would be evidence of it. If we humans were specially created, there wouldn't be overwhelming evidence that we evolved from ape-like creatures from a common ancestor with apes. So with all of the evidence, a cumulative case shows the universe is natural, not supernatural, and that God does not exist. Thank you.
that, alhamdulillah, we conclude the debate. Jazakallahu khair, everyone, for coming out. We really appreciate your company today, this evening. Um, and you know, inshallah, we can see you guys again in the future. And may Allah, can you, everyone give them another round of applause? Because I would also like to give a big thank you to another key organizer. His name is Abdurrahman. He did a lot of this work. And I want to give him a really big, donations. a really big round of applause as well. And inshallah, before everyone leaves, something super important. Again, if anyone is able to, we are really, really asking for donations to help cover costs for the trip um, and for all the events. So if anyone wants to, there is a box for donations outside. There's also the Venmo, which is Davis MSA. Um, and we appreciate anything and everything. Jazakallah, thanks for coming, everyone. Inshallah, have a good night.